Hello, I'm Ronnie Eldridge. Welcome to Eldridge and Company. The United States incarcerates more people than any other country in the world. Even though we have less than 5% of the world population, we account for almost 25% of the world's total prison population. But maybe there's hope that policies are changing. Four years ago, at the country's political conventions, mass incarceration was not mentioned in either major political party's platform. This year, hopefully, it may be in both. Lauren Brooke Eisen is senior counsel to the Justice Program at NYU Law School's Brennan Center, and she's my guest today. And we're going to learn more. Hello. Thank Welcome. Thank you for having me on today. Yeah, please. So we're changing from that old lock em up kind of philosophy, you think? We are. We are. You're right. Mass incarceration, that term, has never been in any, um, the Democratic Party platform or the Republican Party platform ever. And so the, the idea that this year it could be in both party platforms um, is very exciting for those who are working to reduce our reliance on incarceration. I'm sure you're very aware of the statistics that the United States has almost 2.3 million people in our prisons and jails which is um, by far the highest rate of incarceration of any country in the entire world. And we spend something like $230 billion on criminal justice, $80 billion or something for incarceration? We do. We spend $80 billion a year on mm -hmm. corrections. On keeping people in jail or prison. Yes. And um, today, it actually costs more in most states to send someone to prison for a year than it does to send someone to Harvard. So if you think about the, the waste of money, the waste of resources on what we could be spending that money on, um, you know, that's why we do see a lot of Republicans and conservatives joining with Democrats yeah. to um, really start to dig in and chip away at our reliance on incarceration. I wanted to talk about that coalition because it's the coalition of people who are worried about spending the money and the other side that's worried about the justice of the criminal justice system. I mean, the injustice, basically, right? And it's one of the only bipartisan issues right now. Um, Democrats, Republicans, even some libertarians all agree that incarcerating so many people isn't good fiscal policy. It isn't good um, public policy, it's expensive, recidivism rates are through the roof. Recidivism rates in this country are about 70 to 80 percent. That means those who are released from jail or prison in this country, about two-thirds of them, it's a revolving they, door. they return. Let's, let me just ask a question. You've done a study that shows that there really is no correlation, if I understand it, between the, the rate of incarceration and the rate of criminal activities. Is that right? Yes. So you're referring to a study that we published last year call, called What Caused the Crime Decline? And that study looked at incarceration's impact on the crime decline. So crime was on a steady increase from the 1960s through 1991. And in 1991, which is three years before Bill Clinton's um, you know, famous crime bill. 1990, um, yeah. Crime started to decrease in this country. So before the bill was before passed. Before the bill was passed, but they didn't know it then. Violent crime peaked in 1991. Property crime peaked in 1991. And in fact, um, the, the crime decline has, um, has been so astronomical that we are safer today than we've ever been. The crime reached such heights because of crack? And drugs? That's a good question. And we will never know. A lot of very smart people, criminologists, researchers, sociologists, have studied why crime increased, why crime declined. We at the Brennan Center have also studied why crime declined. There, there was a lot happening um, that led up to the increase in crime in this country. And in 1991, crime just started to decrease. And our report indicates that some of the factors, not all of the factors, because we couldn't look at everything, yeah. um, were that increased income helped to reduce crime, um, that increased police played some role, specifically 
data that police use um, to reduce crime, that um, a reduction in alcohol consumption was pretty significant in playing a role in reducing crime. And there may be a whole host of other factors that also played a role in reducing crime. Um, but today we are safer than we've ever been. Despite that, incarceration skyrocketed. So from 1970 to today, we've increased our incarcer incarceration rate fivefold. Um, since 1991, we've doubled our incarceration rate. And all of this was happening while crime was drastically being reduced. Yeah. So we were so behind it that we were just responding to what was, not what is. So the 1994 bill, mm -hmm. that encouraged what? The building of prisons? When did Rockefeller react with his, the Rockefeller drug laws? So the, the Rockefeller drug laws were just in New York and they were um, one they of the first, the yes, they yeah. were one of the first um, drug laws in the country that increased mandatory minimums for uh, low level drug offenses and states are sort of the Rockefeller drug law started this domino effect. Mm -hmm. um, there was a lot happening. Um, states increased their mandatory minimums. California championed three strikes laws. Out, yeah, and, um, and forever, yeah. States reduced um, the parole board's ability to release um, incarcerated inmates on parole. Um, the federal government responded from the 1960s all the way through the 1990s with more money for police, more money for combating crime, um, all the way from Johnson to Reagan to President Clinton, um, culminating with the 1994 crime bill that um, spent, it authorized $12 billion, which in today's dollars is about $20 billion to send to states to build prisons. Um, this money encouraged states to implement and pass what are called um, truth in sentencing laws that require violent inmates to spend 85% of their sentence behind bars. Hmm. And if states pass such laws, they were given these monetary incentives so they to build were prisons. So there were incentives to do this, to yes. put them in the prison that they were also providing incentives to build. You had a, a figure someplace, what was it? It was an average of one every seven days yeah, so, being incarcerated? So a, a new prison was built. <laughs> built. Yes, yeah. um, so there was a time in this country um, where a new prison was built almost once a week. Um, the nation went on this huge prison building spree in the late 1980s and the 1990s. And that really creates its own crisis because those prisons become the center of employment and the economic viability of communities, right? So Absolutely. when you try to cut it later, when you realize you don't want these and you try to cut it, you also receive a different kind of resistance. Absolutely. It's interesting. Yeah. Um, prisons are um, become the center of um, economics for rural communities. We've seen that in upstate New York. We've seen that in a lot of towns in rural America. Um, right now in Appleton, Minnesota, which is you know, three hours west of the Twin Cities, there's a private prison. Um, and it's, it's become the center of the state's discussion about criminal justice reform and what to do with the, um, the, the prisons that are um, overpopulated right now and do you send those inmates to this private prison and you know if you do send the inmates to that private prison in this rural town and then you close it what will it do to the economic viability of this small town so each step creates its own branch in an organizational chart which then leads to all kinds of problems right so, yes I mean you just raised the whole question of now well, is the government still providing the same incentives to build the prisons? No. no. So the federal government does spend about four, more than $4 billion a year sending money to the states for criminal justice purposes. Um, there's something called the Burn Jag Grants. That's about 300 to $500 million a year that's sent to the states for criminal justice um, work and, and um the states are allowed to spend that money on almost anything related to criminal justice, as long as it's under these legislatively created seven purpose areas. Um, but most of the states, you know, they're using that for 
um, buying police cars or buying we equipment. We saw that, all this equipment that we've been offering to them that yes. now we don't want to offer, yes. right? But states are also using that money for evidence-based programs mm -hmm. and drug treatment programs. Mm -hmm. I mean, the field really has moved towards um, you know, more funding more programs and, and not funding this prison spree. And the people within the criminal justice group, mm -hmm. I don't want to call it community, also are more enlightened, right? I hope. Don't we see movements within it in the different states for more enlightened policies and ways to dealing with it? Yes, what we're seeing is, you know, four decades ago, crime was rampant and, and people were scared and they saw crack cocaine on, you know, on the streets and it was a different time. And there wasn't the research that we have now. I mean, four decades later, we have volumes of research indicating how to treat the drivers of why someone may um, you know, find themselves committing a crime in the first place. We know so much more about um, you know, the intersection between mental health issues and the criminal justice system. We know so much more about um, why you know, poverty and, um, and education and how that intersects with the criminal justice system. And we know a lot more about evidence-based programming. So when we talk about reentry and when we talk about rehabilitation, we have a lot. We have many more tools now to really help people and prevent them from recidivism and prevent them from committing crime in the first place. Um, you know, we just didn't know as much in, mm -hmm. in the 1970s and the 1980s about why people may commit crimes or or how to keep people out of the criminal justice system in the first place. Let's go now. To, when you mentioned the town in Minnesota, uh, some communities in because they don't have the facilities, are now contracting out. So we have private prisons, mm -hmm. which in itself is a problem, right? <laughs> we also have, though, there's a federal level and then there are state levels. So the federal government can do just so much. Is that what, I, what we have to conclude? And then the rest of the policies are up to each state? So the, in, in the Federal Bureau of Prisons, um, there are about 190,000 inmates in the federal BOP. What is that, like 8% of the population or something? Um, it's less than 10% yeah. of the nationwide criminal justice population, mm -hmm. the, the people behind bars. Um, the rest of the um, inmates are in jails and prisons spread throughout the country. In most situations, so jails tend to have um, pretrial defendants, so those who are awaiting their trial, they have not been convicted of a crime, um, or you know those who are who are about to plead out, right? Who might be there for three or five days. Mm -hmm. um, additionally, in some jails, so jails typically house people. Um, they could house someone who's convicted of a crime, but usually sentenced for a year or less. Mm -hmm. Um, very common in states like Kentucky and in Louisiana, inmates will actually spend their, you know, many years in the jails because the state prisons um, don't have the capacity to hold mm. as many inmates as um, you know, they need to hold. Um, you know, that the, they just don't have the prison beds. So a lot of states will send, um, you know, convicted, you know, those who have been convicted of a felony to serve their time in a county jail. But the jails, I mean, I'm not saying that all prisons have programs and enough programs, but the jails have none. Typically jails have very little programming mm -hmm. because a jail is not created for long-term um, housing. Um, so you find the rehabilitative programming, the mental health programming, um, the GED classes, all of that at the state prisons. Let's now move to why we have so many people there. I mean, they've been sent there, as you said, because Mandatory sentencing. Uh, so we our <laughs> our uh, incarcerated population has skyrocketed for many reasons, um, and you know at the end of the day, Americans are no more dangerous than residents of other countries of Germany or the Netherlands mm -hmm. or even you know China or, or Russia. Um, we have it. We have so many people in our jails and prisons because of our criminal justice policies. Uh, there was a National Academy of Sciences report that was published in 2014 that found that 
our unprecedented criminal justice population um, is a direct cause of our policies. Even beyond the 2.3 people behind bars today, we have 5 million people on probation or parole or some sort of community supervision. Um, it, it's just, our, our, our criminal justice footprint is enormous. Now the policies are created by elected officials. The policies are created <laughs> by state and federal legislators. Who are many times lacking courage. Is that a good way of putting it? I, I <laughs> think... Because they think it's an unpopular issue. So for a very long time, as you're well aware, uh, you could not be a politician in this country and a pair soft on crime. Um, I mean, you look at President Nixon's um, ad when he was running for president, um, you know, showing images of ordinary Americans saying, yeah. you know, when you hear his deep guttural voice indicating that we must take crime head on, we must be tough on crime. You know, Lyndon B. Johnson, LBJ, um, he called for a war on crime in 1965. You know, ever since then, it's been politically impossible to repair soft on crime until very, very recently. I mean, we even saw when President Clinton was running for office, mm -hmm. um, you know, he ran down to Arkansas to oversee an execution of someone so that he Mental wouldn't. We even saw when President Clinton was running for office, mm -hmm. um, you know, he ran, he did this so that he wouldn't appear soft on crime. Yeah. Um, so, so now there, there is, because we know so much about the drivers of incarceration, um, because we know so much about how incarceration impacts families, tears families apart. Um, we know so much about the collateral consequences of incarceration. There is a political space now for politicians to um, be what they call smart on crime, right? Which is, right. Which is this way of, um, of implementing policies that, that are smart, right? That don't just send people who may violate the law um, to prison or jail, um, but looking at alternatives to incarceration, looking at drug treatment, looking at, there's so many accountability courts, you know, veterans courts, alcohol courts, mental truancy health, courts. Health issues. Increasingly, right. we look at backgrounds of people, experience, lifetime experiences before they commit a crime, right? It, and also, we're much more aware, I think, of, of the effect of incarceration on a family, yes, and a community. So, 2.7 million children today have, have a uh, parent behind bars. Many more children in this country have a parent who, at one point in their lives, was behind bars. Right. So many children uh, and families are impacted by mass incarceration that Sesame Street introduced a new character called Alex, right. who's, um, yes. who's a Muppet whose father is incarcerated, and Sesame Street. Um, they rolled out a toolkit for families and children to use um, so that they could learn more about you know, what having is, an incarcerated yeah. parent. And, and, yeah. um, and you know, that says a lot about our country. And then the system, though, is, is an enormous task. I guess, I mean, it, it's interesting. I, all the grassroots work that goes on, if you look on the computer, all the local state organizations and things like Ban the Box, uh, not... You know, there are all kinds of different organizations, and there are sites on, on the Internet where you can join them. So all of that's important because it ripples in the communities, which then can have an impact on the legislators and help them do these enlightened policies, right? But sadly, what's happening in the Congress today? It stalled the bill. Yes. Yeah, so, um, you know, we're still hopeful that criminal <laughs> justice um, reform will pass soon. Um, I, I think we have, we have an exciting window where we really have this bipartisan support to mm -hmm. um, start to chip away at this phenomena of mass incarceration. And, and I think it would be really important for Congress to, um, to pass legislation because it, you know, even though the, sort of the, the critics have said, well, you're just talking about the Federal Bureau of right. Prisons and how many people is this? at the end of the day, it's really important because people look at Congress, they look at Capitol Hill um, as sort of the heart, you know, the, the, the barometer of what can be done. Um, but what we've seen is that states are leading the way on criminal justice reform. In fact, over the last decade, 27 states have both decreased incarceration and crime, which um, 
which really indicates that you don't need incarceration to reduce crime. I mean, that's over half the states. I want to mention just a few of the things because we're coming near the end, and I want to spend some time on your proposed legislation, which is the Reverse Mass Incarceration Act, or bill. bill. Um, but before that, you know, there's so many reasons and so many different issues to touch on when you talk about criminal justice, right? One is the violation of parole. One is parole itself. Tell me, one is the impact, the, the correlation between imprisonment and poverty. What is it? Twenty percent of people in poverty. Have it, it's actually eighty percent of um, those in the criminal justice system are indigent. Um, so we're really incarcerating um, the poorest members mm -hmm. of our society. There's so many collateral consequences related to incarceration. Seventy million people in this country have a criminal record. That's one in three individuals. 4.4 million people are disenfranchised because of a felony conviction and can't vote. Um, that there, there are just so many collateral the consequences. Difficulties getting a job. Yes, um, <laughs> and, and you know, at the end of the day, we've been focusing. Our, our nation has been moving towards reentry and supporting formerly incarcerated individuals, but with this vast array of collateral consequences, I mean, we haven't even touched on criminal justice debts and that inmates are released into the community and they owe child support, they owe um, court fees and fines, they may owe money to the oh, jail or prison the fees. for yes. um, their, their time behind bars, these pay to stay provisions. And so we're really not setting up the formerly incarcerated for, for a successful reentry into society. You just said that there's some, in some states, prisoners have to pay for their room and board, yes. basically. And so when they get out of prison, they're stuck with that fee. It's like paying your, off your tuition loans at college, but it's not, unfortunately. Yes, in Illinois, they will actually send you a bill for your time behind bars. It, it's pretty astounding when we think about you know, all of the ways that we prevent the formerly incarcerated from successful reentry. So let's talk about your proposed bill, reverse mass incarceration. So the Brennan Center published a proposal called the Reverse Mass Incarceration Act. And what this is, is it's an antidote to the 1994 crime bill. So the 94 crime bill provided billions of dollars to states to build prisons and um, pass laws that were more draconian with harsher sentences. This bill, our proposal, would in fact give $20 billion to states to reduce prison populations. So this proposal would provide $20 billion over 10 years for states to reduce incarceration. And we think that the country is ripe for such a proposal um, because we've seen that so many states can reduce crime and incarceration. And because we've seen that the federal government has incentivized states for so long to build prisons, put to people in them. arrest people, um, you know, this is really, this is funding that does the opposite. And um, we're hoping that the next president will champion this bill and that Congress will pass this bill. And this includes court diversion programs? So the states could use this funding for um, at any evidence-based programming. I mean, the states would have the discretion to use this money you know, how they like it. Um, but it's this carrot um, to, the, to the states to incentivize them to start to roll back um, their prison population. And it's, is it generous? <laughs> the twenty billion. Yeah. Well, um, you know, we, we would love to give even more, but we're realistic that we don't know that you know Congress will find more than twenty billion dollars. Yeah. Um, yeah. But you know, this, the federal funding is really important, and we've seen over the years that even a small amount of federal funding, you know, the Burn JAG um, program is three to five hundred million a year. But but states will reorient policies in, in order to receive this funding. That's the way, actually. Uh, that, that the federal government can try to affect all the states. I mean, they can't go into a state and actually pass legislation about their criminal justice practices. Exactly. So and, they, and we saw with the, the highway funds mm -hmm. that federal incentives are important. And we saw that every single state increased their driving age, um, increased their drinking age to 21 because they were afraid of losing the, the federal highway funds. Mm -hmm. So federal funding can and does impact policy at the state level. So people can learn all about these things if they go to your website? Yes. And it is Brennan? It is uh, www.brennancenter.org. 
And are you in touch with other, organiz other people all over the country? We've amassed this, um, these partners and these conservative partners and democratic partners and um, you know, we sent a letter to the Department of Justice a couple of years ago urging them to change their measures for the burn jag program. And the letter was signed by um, the Texas, you know, the Right on Crime, Texas Public Policy um, Foundation, R Street, you know, the ACLU. So we work okay. both um, sides. With, with both sides, with yeah. conservatives and And, and, you remain, and you're hopeful. I am hopeful. I, I, I really, I, I think that, um, you know, Mass incarceration, as a phrase, is being used more than it ever has, and I think that's important. I think it's important that policymakers talk about over incarceration and, you know, in, in the dialogues, in the debates. We've seen criminal justice reform, a huge part of the presidential um, election debates and, and, and discussions, and, you know, starting with Hillary Clinton's. Um, speech at Columbia University talking about how we need to end mass incarceration. I mean, that's unprecedented for a, for a political we've, campaign. We've come to the end of this okay. program, but I must. I just want to add, mass incarceration has also awakened the consciousness of the public as to the racial injustice of it. it that's what's in that term, right? It, it has. So we didn't talk about racial disparities no, at all, we actually. Um, but we will. You'll come back. Okay. Thank you. And you'll if there are any people you'd like to hear or topics you'd like us to explore, please let me know. You can write to me at CUNY TV, 365 Fifth Avenue. New York, New York, 10016. Or you can go to the website at cuny.tv and click on Contact Us. I look forward to hearing from you. Thank you.